This video is brought to you by Miniature Market. Thousands of board games, discounted prices, miniaturemarket.com. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Hey, tape up that hand, cause we're about to brawl in a bar. Because the last flagon ever is being poured as we speak, and we all want it. So today, we are at the Dragon and Flagon. This is a programming, sort of brawling, fun game by Stronghold Games, designed by Jeff Engelstein, who did Space Cadets and many others. It is for two to eight players and takes 45 to 60 minutes. Let me show you how it's played. I'll see you on the other side. We have the dragon and flagon set up at board level. You can see chairs and tables and mugs on those tables and barrels and the dragon flagon there in the background that's yellowish. We see people lined up and the components are awesome and here's an eye level of all those set up. Now here's the board set up at a bird's eye view. Now this setup is for a beginner game, it's for your first game. You can set this up any way you want, make any game different, but this is the suggested first game setup. You'll notice around the board there's some numbers. These are actually the, the timed movements that's gonna happen over the game, and it's sort of a clock for how the game will end. At the beginning of the game, everyone gets to select a character. They'll take a player board with that character's art, and they'll keep their points, what's called reputation in this game here. These are gonna be given to and taken from people as you, you know, deal damage or take damage. And each person's gonna have some special tokens. These go along with some of the special cards that they have because each player uh, has some cards that are different from everyone else, which makes every character unique. Now here are some of the other characters in the game. Again, different colors, different looks, and different amount of tokens with different labeled special abilities. And then we have one last one because there's actually nine characters that you can choose from. Now each character will have 18 cards, and they will have a character on the back side that shows which character they are. Now here are 13 of the cards that everybody will have. So all characters have these. These gray or yellowish ones are just normal types of, of, of moves and slashing and things. The ones that are purple uh, and then are listed with red text mean basically your character has to be standing up at the beginning of his turn to do these because it's like charging and jumping off chandeliers and swinging and things like that. If your character's laying down, you can't do these. That's the difference between these and these, but everybody has these sort of cards. And every character has four cards that have these yellow borders. Those are the special ability cards that they have and only them. And they do certain things and it gives a character some sort of flavor and does different things. I'll go over some of these later, but each one has some special cards. And everybody receives one red card that's specific to their character as well. This is the dragon flag and this is in the beginning of the board to start off. And this is what people are going after because once you're holding the only dragon flag in the game, you can use your card that has the dragon icon in it. Usually it's a super powerful card, but everyone's is different for each character. Now all those cards I showed are just stacked in a deck that you can hold in your hand and select from during the game, except the dragon card. This one gets tucked underneath your mat and you only are able to use it once you have that dragon and flag in your possession. Anytime you put something in your possession, you put it in your hand, basically place it like this, uh, and you can only carry one thing at a time. So how the flow of the game works is this is a timer, and it's going to go up as uh, people complete their actions. Anytime the timer starts on a specific uh, turn number, all the pieces that are there, all the people, so in this case it's all five of us that are playing, and by the way, when you're playing with uh, five to eight players, everyone controls one character. If you're playing with uh, three or four, everyone controls two characters. In this game, all the characters that are going to be playing this turn go through the planning phase. And so simultaneously, everyone that's there on that timepiece will plan up, to, uh, in this case, at the beginning of the game, they will fill always up to the first two movements. We don't worry about the third one, that's later. Once everyone is planned, we then randomly figure out which player is going to do their move first by shuffling those and pulling it up. So let's say it's me. I would flip this card up and I would resolve it. Now this tells me what I'm doing here. I'm picking up, and the cards are very descriptive. They tell you how they work, plus the rules are really good. Also has symbols of saying, hey, you have to be either be on the space or facing a specific spot to be able to pick something up, like a cup or a chair or something. And this tells you how much time that it actually takes to do this. So I am able to do this. Uh, I'll just do this action. So in this case, I'm facing this chair, so I can take it and pick it up. Other things you can pick up are, you know, the mugs and the dragon flagon. And again, you put it right in your hand, you can only carry one thing, I am carrying a chair. Now, because I only used one time, I go one. But let's say by the end of this turn, somebody might have used one that's three, someone might have used one that's two, two, and one. So once everyone has done their actions, 
We then move this to the next one, and now these two players will random will select and plan, and then randomly figure out who goes first. Now at the end of that last turn, after I've used this, I will place it back in my deck and this will slide down. So now in the planning phase, most of the game, on a normal turn, you'll just be playing one card here because this one will have slid down. And so I had been, I had put this one earlier, and let's say I'm going to do this one. And then again, we randomly figure out who goes first. Let's say it's me. I would flip this over and this says move. And in this case, it allows me to move into any of these spots, depending on where I'm facing. If I stay in the same square, I only go one time. If I move, I use two time. So in this case, I move. Now, after every time you play a card, regardless of whether it's moved or even regardless if you can actually do the action, you can reface your person into any direction. And that's very important because most of the stuff you're doing decides on when you face. So you always change your face at the end of your card so that your next card's active uh, will do it just how you left it from the turn previous. So let's say that was the end of that, this slid down, and let's say we went to the next turn of mine, and I got to then plan and do it again. Let's say I plan, say, this card, and then it was my turn to actually do the action. I would flip this up, and we see throw. Now we can see it costs two time. It's purple again. That, that means that I have to be standing at the beginning of my turn. If I was knocked down, this card would do nothing, and I would have to spend only one time because I wasn't able to use it. This shows that you can throw diagonally, straight, or diagonally. Uh, and if I'm throwing a mug, it can go any distance. If I'm throwing a chair, it can only go one to three squares. This shows how many reputation that person has to give me if I hit them. Uh, two with the mug, three with the chair. This talks about days and falling down. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And you must have a mug or chair in your hand, which I do have the chair. So I can throw this chair, you know, diagonally three spots, forward or to the right diagonally. And this guy's diagonal one spot, so I would throw this chair at him. And because it's the chair, the card said that he would fall down. So he would stay the same way and he'd fall down. And that's important because if he had a, a purple card programmed, he wouldn't be able to use it this turn. Now, when you throw an object like this, whether or not it hits somebody, it gets damaged and it's out of the game for good. And that player would have given me three more of these reputation, which I would be keeping here. And then I would go up two time. Now, sometimes you'll get dazed as we saw there. This tells me I have to put one extra card as dazed. Sometimes it will say two. If I was two, I would actually have to place two cards or up to two cards to fill up even to the third spot. So you have to program more movements than you really want to because you're dazed. And as these slide down, you're going to end up doing actions that probably won't be that great for you. And again, the more powerful the move, the longer time it takes, and you'll have more turns of other people before you get to do another action. Now, speaking of that time, some cards have a clock on them on the left, and this tells me that if I played this card, Sixth Sense, I would take this token that matches it, and I would place it nine spots of time ahead of me, and this effect would last until this is over. For in this case, I could change my face and direction before or after I perform an action, but not both, because you usually have to do it um, after you do an action. So in this case, if I was on this turn right here, I would put this nine steps forward all the way here, which means all the way until my piece gets there, I would be able to use that effect. And just to show you what some of these special cards do, for example, this is a monkey throw. I can throw a mug or chair any distance and in uh, any direction, this guy. So that's a really cool one. This one, I can leap. You know, normally you cannot move through people at all. This allows me to leap over people, over anything, and go where I want. And this is good comboed with this. I could leap anywhere. If I'm directly behind a character who I am facing towards their back, I can do the touch of death for seven, which is huge. Or if they're not to their back, it's just two. So different ways that you can combo some special abilities together. Now in the center square is the dragon flag. And if you pick it up, you put it in your hand. And as long as you have it, you can program it down, face down. And this mine's a dragon kick, which can do seven damage to someone. These are usually very powerful cards. But once it's used, essentially, then it would go back into the center. This is the only piece that actually goes back to the same spot once it's thrown or used. Now, one of the cool things you can do with normal cards that everybody has, you can slash, pretty much hit everybody in front of you like that with a sword. You can yank a rug, so anybody standing on a rug or on a table or anything that's touching a rug will be affected. You essentially could defend yourself. If somebody attacks you, you can use that card. Essentially, you can push tables into people and cause damage. You can push barrels, which go flowing under tables and hitting people. You can charge, which if you're in the right spot at the right time can be very powerful. And if you're standing on a table, you can swing from the chandelier, kicking a bunch of people. Lots of cool cards. And this will continue until the people start to get down towards these special tokens. These four are shuffled and put on these specific spots for a normal game. And once the last player has finished their action on one of these, this will get flipped up. If it's an empty cup, nothing happens. We'll go here. These people do their actions, they'll move up with time. And one of these four will be this, and that ends the game immediately. You simply count up your reputation, and whoever has the most is the winner.
Now, if you flip the board over, there is a sort of pirate variant of the game that has its own set of rules that you can read. I'm not going to go over those now, but just know that it is there for another experience. Well, there is Dragon and Flagon. Now, I actually had a chance to play this during development a couple years ago at BGG Con, uh, and so I've, it's been cool to see it sort of progress through that. Now, I'm going to say that, that games with combat and fighting and stuff is not typically something that I'm into, but what I really liked about this one is that it wasn't complex at all. It wasn't like, hey, I'm going to throw this, I've got to see how many distance I am by you, and you're in a different region, so i got to add some hit points there and more defense, and there's none of this record keep or anything. It's like, hey, I'm going to throw a mug. If you're there, you're going to give me a certain amount of reputation, period the end and it's just very simple in that regard and I like how they streamlined sort of how the damage is given in this game. Now the game itself has what I call excellent table presence. Uh, when this thing is set up you're going to look at this thing and people are going to stop by and stop and go what are you playing? The 3D tables that are standing up there, people standing on tables, the mugs, the barrels, the chairs, it just looks like an awesome game. The components are amazing in it. Now, I really loved how these characters had different abilities and all of them not only looked unique, but felt unique. Uh, every time someone would play one of their special cards, everyone would go, oh, that was so cool. And all of them just seemed to be really cool. And I love that they added that, that everyone has, you know, a majority of the cards that are the same, but ones that are special, they all seem to be very cool. Now, with that being said, you do have a lot of cards to choose from in your hand, but I really liked it because there was always a time where like, hey, this card totally is not going to work for me right now. But I could see in a very specific situation, like Charge, for example, you could pull that off. I think that's six reputation, and it's hard to line it up perfectly. They got, you got to be right in one spot, they got to be in one spot, no one between you, stuff like that. But there's certain cards for certain times, and I like that no matter where you are, even if you've gotten messed over, even if things have gotten chaotic, even if you got dazed and you had to program things further out than you had planned, there's probably a card that you can sort of react to after that's over in your next program move because there's so many different options and I like that about this. So overall, I really enjoyed it. The best part about this game uh, for me was the stories that this game makes. And I think that's always what we're always looking for at the end of a game is, is it rememberable? Uh, and after this game, you know, I, I think we'll be talking about some of the stories of me, you know, swinging from the chandelier and kicking two or three guys or somebody doing the me doing that death grip from behind or somebody or somebody doing the snatch of the you know, snatching the sneal, stealing the uh, I think of the snatch card it stole uh, something from someone and did some damage from them uh, all sorts of things or somebody like ran around with their hat and just it, it, awesome stuff and we were laughing and, and, and talking about that after the game we talked about those stories this one guy just stood there and just waited for people to get on the carpet and just pulled it out and many times there were three or four of us on the carpet and they were getting tons of of a reputation from us and so these funny stories is what helps make this game memorable and why i liked it so i one last thing is programming if you don't like programming you might want to give this one a try because you're only programming one step ahead and it's not that bad it's yes things can still happen yes it can get chaotic and yes maybe even that one step ahead is not going to come out the way you planned but it's not like you're programming three or five moves now if you get dazed yeah you're going to be programming more than normal but it doesn't happen as often the majority of your turns you'll be programming one step ahead and I think it was the right balance. It gave you like a, a feel of, hey, I do have some control here, but chaos can happen. I thought that was a really good balance between uh, chaos and control in a programming game. So overall, I enjoyed it, told great stories. I can uh, recommend this game, and that's Dragon and Flagon. This video was sponsored by Miniature Markets Review Corner. The Review Corner features podcasts, video, and written game reviews by gamers for gamers. Miniature Market, the online gaming superstore. Thousands of board games, discounted prices. Check them out at miniaturemarket.com. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for backing me on Kickstarter and making this season become a reality. I'd like to especially thank those here that have backed me at the credit level. Now, these video reviews are also available by audio on our podcast. It's the intros and the final thoughts on GameboyGeek.com. Click podcast.